topic I'd like to talk about is some basic principles as uh, I personally see it, as well as my company and many of our partners and customers, and then also uh, what we're doing to address these basic principles. Now, from a uh, perspective of, uh, of a, of a uh, conviction I have, if you don't have uh, some basic principles to hold on to in a innovative world, in a world that's emerging, you can be swayed by anybody's opinion. You're in a meeting and this guy says that or this girl says this, and, and it's easy to be swayed and get off track. So you have to have some fundamental philosophical basis. And we hold to these principles that we established uh, about a year and a half ago and are building products and services around them. And so far, it has been very successful and actually uh, delightful to see how this is taking off. So I'm happy to share with you at this great forum uh, sponsored by the Bosch Company. And I, I don't quite know how to switch over. Okay. Here, uh, I'd like to talk to you about the seven principles of the IoT, and then I want to give you two other sevens. So there'll be seven principles, there'll be another seven things, and another seven things, all packed in to 16 minutes. And therefore, uh, you must take notes because it will be a test at the end of this session in the spirit of, uh, of uh, educating here, and I, I hope entertaining as well. So please let me move on to principle number one. It's a statement and an assertion. The IoT presents a big analog data problem. Now, what is big analog data? Well, it's big data, and I think you've heard of big data. It has achieved celebrity status, but it's of the analog nature. Most everything in the T, in the IoT of things, is pent up analog phenomenon, such as vibration, such as light, such as sound, such as location, acceleration, particulates, moisture, uh, speed, um, heat and temperature, for example, all these analog phenomena are digitized. And it's important to know that it's really, really big. Some of my colleagues uh, generate petabytes a day, some generate terabytes in just a few seconds. That's how big this is. So if it's a, this is very profound. If you're dealing with big data, if you like big data, you're gonna like the industrial IoT and the future of IoT as homes and businesses and cities and vehicles are producing this data. So big analog data is a term that has been trademarked um, uh, frankly, by the National Instruments Company, my former employer, and it represents what is sourced from nature, people, and things. It is the data from the things. Okay, let's move on quickly to principle number two. The IoT offers perpetual connectivity. What would you do if you were perpetually connected to your products or perpetually connected to your environment or perpetually connected to your customer? The Apple company is perpetually connected to me, which is why they tried to convince me to buy the Apple Watch. So there's a sell-up notion of perpetual connectivity. You can monetize that. One day, I woke up and I turned on my iPhone and the app for the watch was there, including an advertisement. What was the inference there? Well, you already have the app, you might as well buy the watch, right? That was the inference here. So that notion of perpetual connectivity, one idea is to sell up. But there are really three M's, and that was one called monetize. The first M is to monitor. If you can understand the behavior of your customers and your products, there's a lot of value in that. Next is to maintain and manipulate, if you will, to add another M. Flashes, upgrades, right? The uh, Tesla car has that at night. It gets you know, upgraded with new software, um, et cetera. And then, of course, monetize. We talked about that, being able to sell out more product services and advertise. There are other benefits, but it's a nice way to look at it as you build your business case. Very quickly, moving on to IoT data is really real time. Many of us are in this audience from the IT world of servers and workstations and networks. And we think real time is when the data hits a network switch or when it hits a NIC inside one of the servers so it can be processed. Well, that's not when T0 starts in the IoT. T0 starts in the IoT way back at the things in stage one. And before it even hits IT equipment, there's a whole life where it's actually old then. So what I'm introducing now, a four-stage uh, template that is uh, several years old. It's very durable. It's not perfect, but it is a great way to talk about this amorphous thing called the IoT solution. And let me just describe it very quickly. On the left are the things. It's end-to-end. -end. You need sensors that are either wired or wireless to actually capture data. And then you need a way to aggregate it and to do some upfront processing and upfront uh, maybe decimation or pre-processing or conditioning of the data. And that's where the IoT gateway falls in and the data aggregation systems and DAC, DAQ systems, which are uh, tens of billions of dollar industry you know, right now. And then it goes over to IT. And this is where it hits IT for the first time, a workstation or a server out at a plant or a manufacturing floor computer system, an embedded system you know, out at an energy um, station or something like that or inside a vehicle. 
And then, of course, the infamous data center or cloud. Now, I call the cloud and the data center, well, I call the cloud as just a data center that nobody's supposed to know where it is. I think you would agree with me. So there's nothing mysterious about that. So the cloud and the data center are the same. So there's this notion of sensor all the way to the cloud, which is very possible, but there's a lot of business, a lot of value, and a lot of action that happens in between the thing and the cloud in these stages. And that's why this is so fundamental. And one can impute visualization, as you can see here, analytics, data flow left to right, and control flow equally important. And what my colleague Andy will talk a lot about controlling things. So. And therefore, one can impute management, uh, different stacks, et cetera, across here. Some of the winners in IoT will be able to synthesize these and make them seamless for the end user you know, and the customer. So back to principle number three, this is real time for IoT data, this is real time for IT data, and those who understand the life cycle from here to here will win. How soon do you want to know your asset is going to catch on fire? Probably really immediately. How soon do you want to know if there's a a little girl in front of your autonomous vehicle that you're driving at 40 miles an hour. It's a little girl. It's not a plastic, a garbage can. How just soon do you want to know that to take the correct evasive action for the automobile, right? Because clearly someone isn't going to sacrifice their car, perhaps, to avoid hitting a plastic can. But many of us um, would always agree that to avoid killing someone will sacrifice the vehicle, take a different evasive action. So do you really have time to go all the way to the cloud and back? And that's a very strong phenomenon, a very strong principle in this world of cloud intoxication that we have. Now, personally, I have nothing against cloud. I would assert my company has the best cloud offerings in the industry with our partners, General Electric, with our partners, uh, Microsoft, Azure, et cetera. But the point is, there's a big business for doing work here and getting answers here, as many in that industry would say. So let's move on to number four. The insight can therefore, related to what I just said, be gained in a multiplicity across a spectrum of value. And there are four domains of compute, effectively. And the data insight can have real-time, early life in motion, at rest, and archived. Many times the data is really at rest by the time it even hits a server or a workstation in this formal definition. And here's where it is in motion and in flow. Now, this is not a perfect model and not, not worthy of debate necessarily. But it shows just the different point of view of data from the IoT versus the IT world, you know, where I come from. Three types of insights I like to look at. You can drive business insight. Where's my inventory? How long is that line in the manufacturing, uh, the products? How long is the line at a retail store of customers waiting? Business insight obviously can be derived. But engineering insight, how soon will that turbine at a power plant fail? Or how soon will the robotic arm need maintenance in a manufacturing floor? That's engineering insight. And scientific insight, which I include medical insight, is that tumor benign? Is that a new subatomic particle? Like uh, CERN, the Large Hadron Collider in Geneva discovered uh, a couple of years ago, a new subatomic particle by connecting things like particles and, and control systems to a network. And they created what I would call the scientific internet of things to discover and promote advancement in technology. Uh, so. Those three insights are keen, and it's good to understand your customers and your business. What are you trying to achieve with respect to that? Not everything is a business insight, especially if it's a, a, a government lab or a learning institution that wants to use um, the IoT. OK, let's move on to number five of seven principles. There's a trade-off. <clears throat> Four domains of compute. You can compute and analyze the data at the sensor with smart sensors, but that's very rudimentary today. Contrary-wise, you can move it over and do it at the IoT gateway. Most IoT gateways today are low, low power atom processors or ARM processors or maybe some proprietary switching and routing processors. So they're limited and they're generally closed in this dimension. You can go over to traditional IT in, in servers, PC, right at the edge. And then you can go up to the cloud with, of course, rows and rows of data farms and data centers to do deep, deep analytics. Therefore, if you want immediacy of your answer, if you want to get a temperature, if you want to do a moving average or perhaps a fast Fourier transform, a rolling average or something, you can get it immediately, but that's not very deep. If you want depth, and for example, you need to compare with 17 other sites around the world or seven years of data because there's litigation going on, you need depth, but it's not going to be fast. Now, this is interesting. Now, listen. This is a mutually exclusive objective. Our customers in the IoT world trading off immediacy with depth of insight. 
And if you can solve a mutually exclusive objective, you can catapult your career, you can catapult your company and your customer success. And I learned this when I was young, when my boss came to me and said, make a laptop computer as a lead engineer that battery lasts all day and it's light enough to carry around. Now that was tough 25 years ago, because why? Because I could make it quite heavy and it would last a long time, or I could make it very light and the battery would last 20 minutes. So I told my boss, well that's a mutually exclusive objective, I can do one or the other. And he said, well that's why we hired you, is to solve a mutually exclusive objective. 25 years later I'm sharing that lesson with you. When you can figure out how to give deep insight fast, you will win in many cases. And I'm going to share some more very quickly about that. Okay, so there's the trade-off. And now number, uh, um, let me move on here in the initial time. Visibility is an XV. If you ever study big data, you learn that visibility, um, uh, that uh, the, the uh, V's on the left, variety, volume, velocity, value, we're adding another V of visibility. Why? Well, the edge is remote. And you need to visualize data, you need to visualize application stacks, which are going to be more and more complicated. So graphics technologies, remote desktop technologies like VMware Horizon, Citrix, uh, for example. These technologies that are in the data center used for PCs and remote workstations will be imputed at the edge. So you can see there's a lot of predictive dimensions with these principles. They're not only just statements, but they're predicting what will happen. What's the best way to predict the future? Is to build it, right? Who said that? No time to wait, I gotta keep moving here, okay. The best way to predict the future, right, is to invent it, right, as well. So we're asserting that and we're inventing a future here with some of these uh, predictions. Let me go on to number seven. This is the essence of uh, my personal business and a lot of what my company is doing with my partners here. Data center class compute, which is normally reserved for inside the data center or cloud, will shift out to the edge. That is pretty profound. What am I saying here? Well. Lots and lots of high performance server class cores that do deep computing, high performance computing, enterprise class manageability, data center level virtualization and manageability, scalable storage, all the stuff that's reserved today in the cushy environment, air conditioned environment of a data center, will move to the hostile edge where it must be temperature, shock, vibration hardened. And that's what we mean by shifting left. Shifting left, of course, from this four-stage um, diagram, high-performance computing, virtualization, containers are vogue today in the IT world. All this IT stuff is moving out to the edge in this OT, operational technology world. So the combination of IT and OT is fusing and converging together, and that's what principle number seven you know, is all about. So as I move on here, why would you shift left? There are seven reasons. So take a picture because this will be on the test. You can, it's an open book test so you can use your notes. Take a picture, right? Latency, bandwidth, cost, security. If you go to the cloud, it's going to expose you for security. Reliability, corruption, compliance, and data sovereignty. There are some times when data cannot move away from the cloud. Okay, the as-is model today, an IoT solution, and I have built these personally and been out there. Looks like this, lots of boxes together. We can converge them with the HPE edge line system. This is a brand new product category that takes several things, such as on the left, high performance computing, data acquisition, controls, storage, manageability, remote manageability, that's common in the data center, build it all into a single box. Open industry standards. This will disrupt, like the nature of our discussion today, the industry, because the industry is low performing. The industry is unconverged. The industry is closed. They're not open architectures. And this is a new way of doing things at the IoT edge. Have you ever built a stereo system like that on the left? You have to be a certain age to um, have built that. And uh, then you can't find a cable, and then you're swearing, and it's 3 in the morning. I don't know if you remember those days. OK, what did, Bo what did, the, Bo um, what did the Bose company and others do? They converge a single box. You sit on your counter or your bedroom, right? you turn it on, it's done. Similarly, the Android people and Steve Jobs at Apple said, why don't I take all these things that you carry around separately and put them on a single platform. That's the value of convergence. Computing at the edge to get deep insights fast and do it with a converged system. Seven reasons to converge. And think about your, your smartphone, if you have an Android or iPhone, right? Seven reasons, there's less space, less energy, less latency, 
less cables, less deployment time, less to buy, and less siloing of the world of sensors and data acquisition and IT because you force them to come together. And that's the value here.